Welcome back on this Wednesday night. I'm Pastor Brad from Grace Community Church. We're continuing our devotion in Acts chapter 26, looking at Paul's obedience to the gospel in verses 19 through 23. Paul is on trial here uh, before King Agrippa, before they send him to Rome, and he's basically giving his testimony as he defends himself. He's already characterized the core issue as a believing in the hope. It says, my hope in the promise made by God in verse 6. That's the core issue, uh, what we believe about the promise made by God, about Christ as Savior and Lord. We've looked at Paul's testimony of his conversion in verses 12 through 18. Last time, Monday night, we started verses 19 through 23 and looked specifically at Paul's obedience to the gospel of Jesus Christ. So we talked about obedience and kind of defined obedience uh, and then we went to the first of five P words. These are the five words that start with the letter P uh, that are going to kind of characterize Paul's obedience as explained here. And the first one was that his obedience was purposeful. He says basically that in every place to every people, he was being faithful. Let's go ahead and read through the verses again. I'm sorry. Let's read verses 19 through 23. And this is Paul defending him, his, his uh, testimony. He has been converted radically. And then God told him what he was going to be doing. And then he continues. Therefore, Acts 26, 19. Therefore, O King Agrippa, I was not disobedient to the heavenly vision, but declared first to those in Damascus, then in Jerusalem, and throughout all the region of Judea, and also to the Gentiles, that they should repent and turn to God, performing deeds in keeping with their repentance. For this reason, the Jews seized me in the temple and tried to kill me. To this day, I have, <clears throat> to this day, I have had the help that comes from God, and so I stand here testifying, both to small and great, saying nothing but what the prophets and Moses said would come to pass. And this is that that the Christ must suffer, and that being the first to rise from the dead, he would proclaim light both to our people and to the Gentiles. All right, so we talked about Paul's obedience being purposeful. Uh, the second letter P word is that Paul's ob obedience was poignant. So he, was, he talked about it to every place, to every people, boldly, and overcame his fear in doing so. But it's a poignant gospel because he never changes it. He keeps it crystal clear. Not that anybody could ever change it or should even attempt to. But he keeps it crystal clear and transparent and bold and simple. So what is he saying? Look at verse 20 again. He says he declares in Damascus, Jerusalem, throughout all the region, and even to the Gentiles, to all the people. And here's what he's saying. That they should repent and turn to God performing deeds in keeping with their repentance. The topic was the same everywhere he went. He did not try to appease people. He did not try to use it to gain material wealth. He did not try to use it to gain prestige. There was no feel-good gospel in this. It was repent and turn to God. The only way you can turn to God is through Christ. And then live like it. Live like you believe it. And in uh, 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 3, you remember that the Apostle Paul writes to Timothy, uh, and, and he says this, he says, The time is coming when people will not endure sound doctrine. But basically, they'll just right, surround themselves with guys who will tell them what they want to hear, to let them do whatever it is they want to do. So, so what should we do when that time comes? When the time comes when the gospel message is unpopular and when people won't even put up with it and they're going to cast out those who are teaching the true gospel? We keep teaching the gospel. There's, there's no excuse. There's no reason in the history of humanity nor in the eternity of humanity there will never be a reason to stop preaching the purity of the gospel, which is to repent and to turn to God through Christ. It's not based upon how palatable it is to people who hate God. Our gospel presentation has as its standard what God has revealed and commanded us to say, to repent and to believe and to turn to God through Christ. That's what he says. So it doesn't matter where he is or to whom he's speaking. The message is the same. Repent and turn to God. 
Acts chapter uh, 20. He actually uh, gives us uh, an example of this. Look at Acts chapter 20. Paul speaking to the Ephesian elders. We'll start reading at verse 17. Now from Miletus, he sent to Ephesus and called the elders of the church to come to him. And when they came to him, he said to them, You yourselves know how I lived among you the whole time, from the first day that I set foot in Asia, consistent testimony, serving the Lord with all humility and with tears and with trials that happened to me through the plots of the Jews, how I did not shrink from declaring to you anything that was profitable in teaching you in public and from house to house, testifying both to Jews and to Greeks of repentance toward God and of faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. And he says, and now behold, I'm going to Jerusalem. His testimony and his message was consistent. Turning to God in repentance and faith in Christ did not matter the opposition. It really didn't matter how people accepted it or took it. It was the message given by God. It was the poignant message given by God. And he was faithful and obedient in it. May we be that consistent ourselves. When we think about the gospel, if there's no command to repent and to turn to God through Christ, it's not the gospel. And those things are mutually inclusive. We talk about things that are mutually exclusive. It can't be both. It has to be one or the other. Well, repentance and turning to God in faith are mutually inclusive. You cannot repent without turning to God, and you cannot turn to God without repentance and faith in Christ. It has to, has to always go together. Turning to God in His holiness and in His perfection will drive us to repentance. Remember when God got a glimpse of the glory of God and He fell to the ground, repented. And then it's interesting too, we need to expect people to live like it. It says there, performing deeds. This is verse 20 in Acts 26. Performing deeds in keeping with repentance. If you're saved, act like it. When the prodigal son uh, was saved, when he was called, right? It says when he came to and he awoke, uh, he actually left the pigsty. The Bible knows nothing and God knows nothing of somebody who is truly saved, who is truly repented, who does not change any behavior. We are called to live like it. In John uh, chapter 8, verse 11, Jesus said to the woman caught in adultery, Go and sin no more. And you see that kind of principle throughout Scripture. Turning to God is to turn our back on sin. Turning to God in faith is to leave a, live a completely different lifestyle. So Paul's obedience was purposeful. It was poignant. It was also, this one might be a stretch, it was also problematic. Look at verse 21. Just selfishly problematic. Not really problematic. It led to some problems in his life. <laughs> is the point. That's all I'm trying to say. For this reason. right? Because he was teaching repentance and turning to God. Because he was saying that they need to perform deeds in keeping with their repentance. For this reason. The Jews seized me in the temple and tried to kill me. The Jews tried to kill him. God protected him. God was working it all out for his glory. 1 Peter 4, verse 12, God uses the Apostle Peter to write these words. Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery trial when it comes upon you to test you as though something strange were happening to you. We should not be surprised when it's difficult to live a Christian life. We should not be surprised when people... All right, nobody's actually tried to kill me at this point in, in ministry yet, but there's been a lot of opposition. Um, so we shouldn't be surprised. It happened to Paul. He was willing to endure it. So are we willing to endure what will come? All those who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. Are we willing for the sake of the glory of God and the gospel to endure persecution, to endure hardship, to give up the rights to self, to live completely and fully in submission to uh, God? Paul's obedience to the gospel of Christ, uh, number four, was predicted. Look at verse 22. To this day, I have had the help that comes from God. So I stand here testifying 
both to small and great, saying nothing but what the prophets and Moses said would come to pass. That Christ must suffer, that being the first to rise from the dead, he would proclaim light both to our people and to the Gentiles. Paul is making it crystal clear in his defense that he is not talking about a new religion. It's not a new cult. It's not new revelation. It's built upon the foundation that was laid in Moses and the prophets. It's built upon God's revelation of the Old Testament. It's a necessary, uh, it's a necessary fulfillment of those things. This is not new information. And then he says that that's that what is taught is that the Christ, that the Messiah, that the hope of the promise made by God, that the Christ must suffer, that he'd rise from the dead, and that he'd give light to Jew and Gentile. It would save. That that's what the Old Testament taught. So as Paul is, is here and he's professing these things, he's saying, look, this is, this is not new. This is what God had already revealed to us. This is what we should have expected. So why are we surprised at it? We should not be surprised at it. So are we biblically grounded? Is our worldview tied to what was revealed, what has been revealed in Scripture? Do we think that's just all like past and really doesn't apply to us today? Well, Paul in the New Testament is pointing to Moses and the prophets of the Old Testament and saying this is what you should expect. So we in the New Testament look at the totality of Scripture and we seek to live a life for the glory of God, building upon the foundation that's been laid, ultimately the cornerstone, which is Christ, all of Scripture is about Christ, and then our worldview and our thinking and our, and our actions and our belief, we understand that it's all based upon, based upon historic, God-given revelation in Scripture. So if there's something that's new or novel, if there's a new belief that's never been taught anywhere in Scripture, it's error. Unless it's a new application of, right application of Scripture. But, but we don't need the novel. What we need is to know what has been revealed for the glory of God. So Paul's obedience was tied to that which had been predicted in, predicted in the Old Testament. And he was just faithfully living it through in the new, as we are called to today as well. So are we being, are we biblically grounded? Are we living biblically? And then lastly, I guess this is number five. Can't be number five. It is number five. <laughs> this is the fifth word that starts with the letter P. Paul's obedience was purposeful, poignant, problematic, and predicted because um, it's built upon the foundation of, of the Old Testament. And then he presented it. He, he, this is this is interesting. Look at verse 24. As he was saying these things in his defense, Festus said with a loud voice, he kind of scoffs at him, it's like the bika. Paul, you're out of your mind. Your great learning is driving you out of your mind. So Festus's response is just rejection, overt rejection and mockery. He acts as if the truth that Paul is presenting, the eternal truth based upon the eternal God, is just silly and foolishness. And that's fine. Some people are going to respond that way. It doesn't change the truth. The, <laughs> the very being, nature, and gospel of God himself was not dependent upon Festus' uh, uh, admitting it. And then he transitions, Paul transitions, he answers Festus, first of all. I'm not, I'm not crazy. And then he turns to point the attention to King Agrippa. Let's read the whole of Paul's response, verse 25 and following. But Paul said, I'm not out of my mind, most excellent Festus, but I'm speaking true and rational words. For the king knows about these things, and to him I speak boldly. For I am persuaded that none of these things has escaped his notice, for this has not been done in a corner. All these things have been done publicly. He's known about these things. King Agrippa, do you believe the prophets? I know that you believe. And Agrippa said to Paul, In a short time would you persuade me to be a Christian? And Paul said, Whether short or long, I would to God that not only you, but also all who hear me this day might become such as I am, except for these chains. 
What an amazing testimony that Paul has given as he's on a quasi-trial here. And then he's going to be sent to Rome. But he presented the gospel. And then he called for a response. And when Festus kind of interrupted him and said, you're crazy, Paul turned the tables and he answered. And he said, I'm not crazy. These things are true and rational. And then he turned his focus to Agrippa. And he, and he called for a response specifically from Agrippa. Do you believe? Do you believe the prophets? Agrippa, you're, you're Jewish. You claim to believe the prophets. They spoke of Christ, and I'm just affirming Christ. And Agrippa's response, I don't know exactly how I would categorize it. Maybe it's Maybe he's just making an excuse when he says, in such a short time, would you persuade me? Maybe he's just kind of passing the buck. He's not letting Paul put him on the spot. Maybe he's not willing to give up everything he has, which he would likely have to, obviously, if he confessed Christ. Maybe, maybe he says it's unreasonable to make a decision with such a short amount of time to ponder it. I mean, all of these are just excuses. The part of Paul's obedience is presenting the gospel. Are we inviting people to follow Christ? With our life and with our words, are we inviting people to follow Christ? Are we rationally giving a defense of the, of the faith built upon the word of God as displayed in our testimony? And then are we calling people to follow, to repent and to believe and to submit to God as Savior and Lord and to experience both the joy and the persecution that comes from living a life for God's glory? Let's pray. Father, we pray that you would help us to be obedient. We pray that you would help us to follow you as Paul did, faithfully. When we fail, may we be quick to repent. We pray that you would give us the courage to live the gospel. We pray that we would be obedient, that we wouldn't let anything distract us, that we would be purposeful, that we would be intentional, that we would endure persecution, whatever you allow to happen in our lives. May we stand up under it for your glory, continuing to be found faithful and to present the true gospel of Jesus Christ. May we live that out in our life. May we continue to be sanctified for your glory. And Father, may we be bold and accurate and articulate and uh, honestly glorifying to you as we seek to share the gospel. And may you use the foolishness of the message preached to continue to save, to change hearts and eternities forever and as always for your glory. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.